Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks, what is the relationship between extroversion and psychopathology? So extroversion is one of the big five traits from the five-factor model. I remember the five traits through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Each of the big five traits has six facets. So for example, with extroversion, the six facets are warmth, gregariousness, assertiveness, activity, excitement seeking, and positive emotions. The facets tend to move together. So if somebody's high in excitement seeking, they're more likely to be high in positive emotions. But the facets can move independently. For example, I've seen a number of people who are high in warmth, so they're friendly, but they're low in gregariousness, so they're not outgoing. This combination leads to somebody who is good at one-on-one -on -one conversations because they can stay engaged. They don't get distracted when another person comes into the room or comes into the area. So they can really just focus on that one person and not have a desire to kind of run off and talk to other people. So in this video, when I talk about psychopathology, I'll be referring to mental disorders that are not personality disorders and other mental disorders that are personality disorders. So for the sake of expediency, I'm going to use the Axis 1, Axis 2 system. Now this is an older classification system we saw in the DSM that's now been abandoned, but it's still actually pretty useful in my opinion. So essentially, Axis 1 mental disorders are mental disorders that are not personality disorders, and Axis 2 disorders are personality disorders. I'm simplifying that a bit, but that's essentially what the structure indicates, and that's what I'm going to go with here in this video. Now, when looking at the five-factor model, we see this socially desirable profile, right? And typically, this is a profile that's high in openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness, and low in neuroticism. Therefore, the least socially desirable profile would be the opposite, low in openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and high in neuroticism. Then we see this profile that's most associated with psychopathology, which is actually fairly similar to the least socially desirable profile, except for openness to experience. So it's the same as the least socially desirable, but the openness to experience is high instead of low. Now in terms of access to pathology, personality pathology, it makes sense that there would be a connection between this and the five-factor model. One could argue that personality disorders are essentially extreme manifestations of personality traits. So of course they could be represented by different combinations on the five-factor model. For example, high openness and high extroversion are associated with histrionic personality disorder. High extroversion and low agreeableness are associated with narcissistic personality disorder. Low conscientiousness and high extroversion are associated with antisocial personality disorder, and low extroversion is associated with avoidant personality disorder. Those are just some of the combinations that are associated with different personality disorders. Now things become much less clear when we talk about Axis 1 pathology. It doesn't really fit as clearly as what we see with Axis 2 pathology. However, there are some associations between Axis 1 psychopathology and the five-factor model. Now, there are a few theories on this subject from many years ago, but in general, here's what they say. I'm kind of putting them together here. So these theories would essentially say that neuroticism explains a lot of Axis 1 psychopathology. So high neuroticism is associated with depression, anxiety, hostility, panic, and phobias. So it's clear how this could connect with several mental disorders. We see that high openness has been connected to disorders involving psychosis. So if somebody has a lot of creativity and they tend to fantasize, maybe at an extreme level, that somehow leads to or is connected to psychosis, which of course is a symptom of schizophrenia. It's not clear if low openness to experience is actually connected to any Axis 1 psychopathology. Now, low agreeableness is connected to substance use disorder. High agreeableness is connected to depression and bipolar disorder. Low conscientiousness is connected with substance use disorder and high conscientiousness is connected with obsessive compulsive disorder. So this leaves us with extroversion. Extroversion is actually pretty interesting in this regard. 
often it's conceptualized as only having a relationship to Axis I psychopathology at the low end. So low extroversion has been associated with anxiety, depression, and agoraphobia. But there's this idea that high extroversion is good in pretty much every way. It doesn't lead to an increased risk of any type of Axis I mental disorder. But we see in more recent research literature that high extroversion does come with certain risks. But in order to understand extroversion and psychopathology, we really have to examine this trait at the facet level. I mentioned before that there are six facets to extroversion. I'll go through them really quickly here. So warmth, we see that somebody's friendly and kind if they're high in warmth. Gregariousness, here somebody would be talkative, spontaneous, and outgoing. Assertiveness, somebody high in this facet would be confident. They would be enthusiastic, aggressive, and somewhat dominating. We see activity. Here somebody's energetic. They always want to be busy. They're in a hurry. Excitement seeking. Here somebody's adventurous, courageous, and bold. And then we have positive emotions. So here we see a person who's optimistic, cheerful, and happy. So now looking at low extroversion at the facet level. If we consider a disorder like social anxiety disorder, it has a negative correlation with all of the extroversion facets. So the lower the level of extroversion, the higher the risk of social anxiety disorder. But what really stands out here is its connection specifically to warmth and positive emotions. They really explain much of that relationship. So somebody can be low in the extroversion facets of gregariousness, assertiveness, activity, and excitement seeking, and they may not be at a much higher risk for social anxiety disorder. Again, positive emotions and warmth tend to explain that relationship. Now, agoraphobia is fairly similar. We see a negative correlation with all the extroversion facets, but the facets that really seem to be the most important would be warmth, gregariousness, and positive emotions. I mentioned before how low extroversion has an association with schizoid personality disorder, which of course is on access too. But there's an interesting finding here at the facet level. It's really mostly related to warmth, gregariousness, and positive emotions. So the same facets that seem to be connected to agoraphobia. Now in terms of high extroversion facets and psychopathology, we see that excitement seeking and positive emotions are associated with mania. Now mania is a feature of bipolar disorder. Technically, in order for somebody to have bipolar disorder, they only need to have mania, but usually we see both mania and depression. Now what's really interesting here is that these two facets, excitement seeking and positive emotions, only seem to connect with certain symptoms of mania, specifically manic energy, excitement, and elation. In a way though, this makes a lot of sense. If we think about positive emotions, for example, and relate that to mania, mania could be thought of as an uncontrolled manifestation of positive emotions. So if somebody's too optimistic, too cheerful, and too happy, that can lead to a problem as well. So it's not just low positive emotions like feeling flat, it's also high positive emotions that can lead to difficulties. Now one interesting point here about positive emotions. So we see that extroversion has this association again where high extroversion is connected to mania and low extroversion is connected to depression. But that doesn't mean that low positive emotions means that somebody's going to have negative emotions. Negative emotions is a separate facet measured on neuroticism. So if somebody's low on positive emotions, they're going to tend to present as flat. They just don't have any positive emotions. That doesn't mean they're going to have negative emotions. So this is interesting when we think about depression. A lot of times people think about depression as the presence of negative emotions, not simply the absence of positive emotions. But understanding depression from a personality point of view, it could be, in part at least, simply the absence of positive feelings. Somebody doesn't have to have active negative feelings to feel depressed. Now I've talked about the relationships between psychopathology and high extroversion and low extroversion, but we also see that psychopathology is related to high scores on certain facets and low scores on other facets. For example, high excitement seeking and low warmth predict antisocial personality disorder, and high excitement seeking and low positive emotions predict substance use disorder. 
So it's not always helpful to think of personality traits as being associated with certain problems, with the trait expressed at a high level and other problems with the trait expressed at a low level. Only the facet level analysis can tell us what the relationship is really like. Looking at the facet level gives us a better idea of the total risk of being high or low in extroversion. For example, we see this idea that, okay, high extroversion appears to be associated with some psychopathology, but certainly low extroversion must be associated with more psychopathology. But looking at the facet level, we see that high excitement seeking tends to be more strongly associated with psychopathology than low excitement seeking. Also, some facets don't appear to play an important role either way. For example, assertiveness doesn't have a strong association with psychopathology. It doesn't seem to be connected whether it's high or low. Now, I know whenever I talk about topics like extroversion and psychopathology, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of extroversion to be interesting. Thanks for watching.